Good evening and welcome to the Northampton School Committee meeting of Thursday, March 24th, 2016. I'm Mayor David J. Markowitz, uh, chairing the meeting, and I will ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mrs. Thomas here. Present. Mrs. Malvern. Here. Mrs. Present. 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 Mr. Here. Mr. Present. Mr. Present. 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 Thank you very much, Laura. Um, the first item on the agenda is public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to make public comment? No? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Next is announcements. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Yes, Ms. Fallon. So I, I hope I'm staying in the spirit of announcements. Um, the Sid Fleischman uh, um, Humor Award is an, award is an award for authors whose works exemplifies the excellence of writing in the genre of humor um, and children's literature. And our very own at large school committee member, Molly Burnham, <laughs> received this prestigious award for her first book that she published. Teddy Marr is almost a world record breaker, and we're so proud of her. And now that we know how funny she is, we <laughs> think she brings a little levity to school committee meetings. So I just wanted to congratulate her. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. Hearing none, we'll go into uh, reports and recommendations. Um, the first uh, and foremost item on the agenda is a continued discussion of the FY 2017 budget and I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. The FY17 budget has been out for approximately a month for public comment. I'd like to begin by um, going through the public comments that have been received to date <coughs> and talking about um, recommendations in light of the comments. The first comment, um, these are arranged pretty much in order of volume of comments. The most commentary was received on the reduction of elementary library ESPs. Um, as of last week, we had received eight requests or eight comments uh, questioning the wisdom of that and asking in different forms um, to preserve library ESP positions. Since that time, we've received an additional two or three comments along those lines. Um, I have, I, I want to make a, a amended recommendation um, concerning this budget based upon that public co feedback. Um, initially, the plan was to eliminate four library ESPs and to um, replace them with two elementary library media specialists. The concerns raised um, really had to do with the coverage of the libraries because with two libraries being covered by, or with four libraries being covered by two people, that left a half a day at each of the elementary libraries to be covered with someone else. Um, the initial plan was to have those libraries covered by the tech integrationist specialists for that, that other half day. Um, but I've rethought the plans based on feedback, and so at this point, what I'd like to recommend is that we reduce two library, um, elementary library ESPs, and hire two elementary librarians. We would deploy them in teams um, so that each team of a librarian and an ESP were responsible for two schools and set them up on alternate schedules so that libraries would be open all the time staffed either by the librarian or the ESP. And I know um, as I tried to explain that in writing and now I've explained it in words, that's been somewhat um, difficult for people to follow. So if I could just do an example um, of what I'm talking about. If we could imagine for a moment um, that the mayor was a librarian and I was a library ESP, we would be a team, let's say we were assigned to both Bridge Street and Jackson Street. We'd have all opposite schedules, so when he was at Bridge Street, I'd be at Jackson Street and vice versa. That would ensure that the um, library was maintained full time either by a librarian or a library ESP. And I would leave it to the principals to work out a schedule that ensured both buildings had equitable amount of time um, with the librarian and the ESP whether that worked out to be half days at each school or um, three days in, in one week at one school and two days the next week at um, the other school. 
Um, but I think that addresses the concerns that were brought forward with respect to that budget um, recommendation. So the budget book um, has been prepared with that modified recommendation. Um, of course, the initial plan um, is still viable. If, if you like that one better, we could adjust the pages back. The next comments we received were um, a request to add reading intervention personnel at Jackson Street School. We had three um, requests, or three comments for that. Um, my recommendation is not to um, add that position. Right now, as, as this budget was presented, we'd have equity among the four elementary schools with each school having a um, primary preventionist, a reading specialist, and a math specialist. Um, as you recall, this budget includes adding a half-time um, specialist position at Leeds so that everyone has the same array. Um, I think that adding an additional position at Jackson would then cause us to be unbalanced again in terms of our um, support services across the district. Um, when you recall from the first view budget, schools being um, presented by percentile ranking in terms of economic need, three of the elementary schools were all in the, in the same zone. Um, so it, it's not a situation where the population at Jackson is vastly different from the population served by the other elementary schools in terms of need. So I think that um, those comments um, I would recommend not be followed up on. Then there were um, two comments concerning locating the preschool at Leeds, um, concern about whether that was the right school. Um, and since that, since the end of last week, I received another um, concern about that from the Leeds School Council um, and had a conversation with a staff member this afternoon. The rationale for placing the additional preschool <coughs> program at Leeds is that it's the only elementary school that doesn't have a district-wide special education program. Ryan Road has the goals program. Jackson Street has the behavior program. Bridge Street has the ASD program and the um, learning disabled disabilities program. Um, and so Leeds at this point has been uh, a school without either a, a district-wide special education program or an ELL program. Um, I think in terms of equity, it makes sense um, to begin begin placing programs like those at Leeds when the need arises. Um, I also think that we should start standing up an ELL program at Leeds. I didn't present that as part of the budget because we can do that with existing staff. Um, but right now we're at a point where we're spending a lot of money to, Brit to bus um, ELL students from Leeds to Ryan Road. And we're just at the point we're about to go from a small bus to a large bus. Um, so the cost of not having a program at uh, Leeds is, is possibly just about to become more expensive. So I think um, there'll be a cost avoidance in the long run, and I also think there will be um, a, a benefit in terms of equity across the schools. That being said, um, we know that the preschool program is the area where school age population is growing the fastest. It's possible very possible that we may have to expand again at preschool. If that has to take place, then I would um, recommend probably bringing in another elementary school into the mix rather than continuing to build on at Bridge or to build on at Leeds. Um, one of the benefits was um, reducing the number of students who would have to do a transition from preschool to kindergarten. You know, we're going from 75% to 50% if we could go to three schools, then we could get, get it down to just a quarter of the kids who have to make a transition. Um, so my th thoughts on that. Um, there was one comment supporting the preschool plan, and just as, as it was presented. There were two requests to fund the sabbaticals. Uh, <coughs> I rec I, my recommendation stays the same because even with the changes that I'm proposing tonight, if they're approved, we still be will, we will still be reducing staff. And I think it's really hard to approve sabbaticals while you're simultaneously reducing staff from their positions. Um, the next is a concern that um, 
one additional ETL is not enough. The commenter said if, if you only give one ETL, it doesn't really take a burden off of the special education teachers. And so um, I am recommending making a change with that not just on the basis of that one comment, but really it's connected to the comments about the other um, library ESPs. If we're going to maintain those positions, then we have to cut something else in order to pay for them. And um, since there was only one comment um, about the ETL and it was saying that maybe the ETL was not enough, um, I think that's a place where we could make the cut. However, um, the cost of replacing the ETL um, or the cost of, of replacing the two library ESPs with the ETL position is not a, a full trade. There's still some money left over. And so what I'd like to do is use the additional money left over from the ETL salary to pay for contracted services for evaluations for private school students. Because in some of my conversations with staff about this, um, they, were, they were clear that um, the paperwork was a concern but on all those concerns, the thing that was most um, difficult for them sort of to just stomach was providing evaluations for students who attend school, private schools who are not in their classroom, they'll never get to work with. Um, it, it seems to them, and I agree, like um, a tremendous use of time for kids who are not Northampton public school kids that takes them away from the services that we want them to provide. So um, in addition to reducing the ETL, or maybe it's in addition, but sort of in recognition of reducing the ETL, mo this modified proposal provides the additional funding for contracted services for those evaluations. Um, there, was a, there was one comment, I should say, in support of the additional ETL, but even that comment also had a comment saying, please restore the library ESP. So um, I take that one as kind of with a grain of salt. Um, so next was support for additional counseling and psychological staff. Um, essentially this person was commenting that the addition of psych the psych psychologist and counselor for um, JFK was good but not enough. Um, and I just don't feel that within the context of the budget, we can afford any more clinical or psychological staff. And I also think there are other priorities um, that we need to address as well. Um, so there was a one request for additional clerical support. That was um, specifically for support for JFK in the guidance um, suite. I just I think it would be nice, but I don't think it's something that we can that I can support given all the rest of the needs of the district. There was one concern about re the reduction of the 0.6 special educator at JFK. Um, based on incoming case sizes for um, academic support, I think that that's a, a cut that can certainly be made. Um, I think the person who made the comment had some, some knowledge about current needs, um, but in just as the need for counseling is going to be increasing at JFK next year, the need for academic special ed pullout services is going to be reducing. So <coughs> I think we can make that cut. Next was a concern about recruiting uh, playground supervisors. Uh, the question was, was the, um, was the amount high enough? Would someone work just for a couple of hours a day for um, what was proposed? The only data I have on that is that we had um, playground supervisors last year at Bridge Street. We have playground supervisors currently at Leeds, and um, the principals have been able to fill the positions at those rates. So I think we could probably fill others at those rates. Um, there was one concern about making sure there was enough uh, support for art and music. So I just wanted to clarify for um, the public that there are no proposed budget cuts to art or music in this budget. Um, there was one request not to um, increase funding for STEM. Um, that was, I think, related to it, um, concern that uh, STEM is taking up all of the oxygen in the room lately and there's not enough, um, not enough being um, provided for recreation or for humanities or for art and music. But again, since we're not cutting in those other areas, I don't think this is a case of um, compromising those other program areas in order to add STEM services. Um, there 
was a concern about the reduction of a preschool ETL to half time. Um, I'm not recommending a change based on that. Um, I, based on the, the caseload that the preschool um, has, I think that a half time position is sufficient to um, to do all of the do all the IEPs. I say that based on my own experience as a team leader. Um, when I uh, when I had a team leader when I was in a team leader role, um, I had responsibilities in multiple schools, multiple grades, um, and I think I have a sense of what a good caseload for a team leader is. Next um, is a request for additional textbook funding. I say um, no changes recommended in the budget because of that, but um, I did point out to the commenter that there is $22,000 of additional funds for principals to use it in their building-based budget at their discretion. So if there is a need for textbooks, um, Principals now have more um, funds at their disposal in order to purchase those. So that's public comment, and um, I then like to walk you through the features of the FY17 budget book, drawing your attention to um, <coughs> pages. So um, the meat of the budget begins with superintendents. Budget, uh, superintendent's budget message. Um, overall, it's a 2.75% increase. I, um, in the message, um, acknowledged the work that the city did for the schools last year in extending beyond the 2.75 range, which I think really set us up for much better success in this year's budget. Um, and I think that uh, the changes we're able to make this year are in part predicated on the fact that we were able to get some additional support last year. Next, um, I have the district improvement goals for next year. Uh, differentiating instruction <coughs> focuses on differentiating up. It's the last year of professional development in differentiated instruction. The analysis of subjective viewpoints, which is a QSORT activity um, that was discussed at the retreat. The QSORT actually began this evening uh, Leeds School at the spaghetti dinner. Um, I was in the library until just a few minutes before the meeting taking uh, cue sorts from parents who came to that event and Mr. Kanata is now dutifully continuing with the second seating of the spaghetti dinner um, gathering information from parents. We will be um, rolling out a schedule of other sites um, and other events and um, outreaching to the community for people to participate in that um, cue sort. It's not a process that has a large impact on the budget, but it is one of the goals for next year, and so I wanted to make sure that it was at least brought to the fore in an early stage of this budget. Um, the third goal is um, working on our decision-making processes. Um, again, a, a goal with not a large um, fiscal impact, but one that I wanted people to be aware of. And then below that are the theories of action that sort of drove those district improvement goals. Turning to tab one, <coughs> you'll see that the top line of this is the superintendent's proposed budget for FY17. This is the amount um, that if you approve of this budget, I would ask to have included in a motion. The next page breaks down the proposed budget by cost center. Um, one thing I wanted to bring to your attention is, although the local appropriation change is $476,474, the total change in the budget is $1.2 million. Um, that's possible because uh, our non-appropriated um, sources of funding are up this year. Most, um, most specifically, School Choice is up $79,000, that's Choice into the district. Um, circuit Breaker is up $188,000, and um, if the changes to the athletic um, fees are approved, there'd be an additional $17,000 um, in the athletic revolving. That's not all from the fees. The, the fee change itself is about $7,000, but we are expecting some um, changes to our um, athletic revolving account due to fundraising and some other activities. Um, 
The next two pages are just sort of an example of the many ways we need to report our budget information to the Department of Education. We're required to break it down by cost center. We're required to break it down by pupil. We're required to break it down by major budget area, by DESE function code. So all of those are in there for your review. Um, it's just different ways of looking at the same pie of money. After the pie charts, there is a um, page describing the staffing changes that are included in this version of the budget. Um, you can see that um, the changes to the library ESPs are included in there. It's a minus two now instead of a minus four. Um, overall, it's a net change of 1.18 positions positive. And again, the um, numbers don't balance out exactly here because some of the funding comes from other sources other than the appropriated funds. Um, next, um, we have the FY17 budget staff FTEs. This is in an unsorted um, format, although they are in some ways clumped throughout the budget. This gives you a chance to look at all of the FTEs in the district in a single report. And then after the FTE report is a summary of all funds from, from all sources. Um, so you can see the appropriated amount is the first column, and then you see the other things that go into this budget, school choice, circuit breaker, food services, athletic revolving account, bus revolving account, and grants and other um, revolving accounts. So then, Tab two is just the first view budget. Then we get into the individual cost centers. One thing that I'd like to bring to the public's attention is that <coughs> each section begins with a profile. Um, and I'd like to, um, for those who are interested in reviewing the budget, really ask them to spend some time with the profile because it talks, there's a lot of information in each of these about the accomplishments at each school and the goals that the schools have moving forward. Um, so I would just point out in the Bridge Street um, profile, their expansion of the SPED inclusion model, which began last year. The special ed inclusion program had, was really just limited to two classes last year. It had a real profound impact on student achievement in those classes. And so based on that, they've um, decided this year to um, really move away from a pullout model of providing special education services to a fully inclusive model and use this, this special ed staff within the classroom um, so they can support kids with disabilities and all kids. Um, next is the Jackson Street profile. You'll notice it's a little bit different. This is the place where I've told principals they can personalize the budget. That's kind of a controversial uh, ju judgment in my office. Some people thought maybe a little bit more uniformity might be better, but um, I don't know. The schools have, un have unique personalities, and uh, this is a place where they can show. What I think is unique about the Jackson Street um, Center is uh, the third page of their profile where they talk about, or where, where they list several quotes from staff, faculty, and families. And one of them really strikes me. Um, it's the first one, saying it's hard to put in words what is great about Jackson Street School. All I can come up with sounds like platitudes. We're a community, we listen to children, we lead with kindness, we assume the best about people, we understand who children are, we are always learning. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that in your leisure, but just wanted to make sure I brought that to your attention. The next cost center is Leeds. Um, from my perspective, the biggest story at Leeds this year was exiting level three. They're now a level two school based on student achievement increases last year um, and continuing to make changes to get even better. Next is the Ryan Road um, cost center profile. If you read through it, you'll see that a lot of um, the work at Ryan Road has been around enhancing their technology. Um, there's a vote that'll come up on the agenda later tonight for additional technology for Ryan Road School. It's been, um, it's been a big focus of their school in improvement efforts and I think they've made tremendous gains in the past year and a half. Um, they went basically from a non-Wi-Fi school with some teacher workstations and a 
um, computer center and I think three iPads to now fully Wi-Fi. Um, they've got a cart of Chromebooks. They um, are building their MacBook, their Mac inventory, and um, they have added several smart boards. And you can see their goal is to keep heading down that path. Next is JFK Middle School. Um, JFK's profile, probably because it is um, now we're in middle school, much more academic than the elementary um, profiles. There's a lot of information about the, the work that's been done this year with the vertical math team, um, aligning curriculum horizontally and vertically with the elementary and the high school levels, and their data team um, to learn more about their weaknesses and put in strategies to address their weaknesses. Next is the high school um, profile. Now we're getting into very academic um, type of accomplishments. Um, so I would just mention a few. Um, Northampton High School also went up in level this year. They went from level two to level one. Uh, based on the ranking system, which um, you know, I've said here, I'm not sure we're supposed to rank schools on MCAS scores, but nonetheless, um, they're in the top 25% of high schools in Massachusetts based on their MCAS scores. Um, they continued AP program excellence with 954 exams administered, 275 students with um, a qualifying score of three or higher. They created honors level um, courses for integrated math two and integrated math three and create an English language learner US history course and as you recall um, from the course of studies that you approved a few months ago they're looking to expand course offerings again next year um, next is the athletic cost center I think what's important here is the size of the program um, we have a lot of two sport athletes and a lot of um, three sport athletes, so this is not an unduplicated count, but there's 700 athletes um, who play one or more sport, sports throughout the school year. Um, there's information about um, all of the athletic victories that um, our teams had over the course of the past year in that, in that cost center. Um, next is the special education cost center. The thing for me that is most notable here is the number of students served. Um, there are currently 630 students who qualify for special education. Last year, there were 670 students who qualified for special education. Now, that's a very important indicator to me because remember, the whole goal of the RTI program was to reduce um, the proportion of our population that required special education service. So. That's about a four and a half percent decrease, you know, through one round of intervention. I think that's um, a good start. Um, we have we have farther to go, but I think it's an indicator, and honestly, an indicator that I didn't think would come forward so quickly. I thought it would be kind of a lagging indicator, um, but I think it's good that we're showing some progress in reducing special education um, enrollment. As you know. Many of the changes we're able to propose in this budget are possible because of um, some of the changes we're able to make reducing special education costs. Next is the um, central services maintenance and gap uh, maintenance cost center. In their profile, the most important thing to note is the savings that we're seeing in that cost center due to lower energy costs. Um, so that completes the, the uh, cost center portion of the budget book. Tab 13 um, includes grants and revolving accounts. Um, so the first page is all the FY16 grants. This is as of March 1st, 2016, because we're always on the hunt for more grant funding. Um, so total grants we're using this year, or have been awarded this year, is just over $2 million. Um, the next page <coughs> shows all the revolving accounts. Um, the one account I might draw your attention to here is school choice. Um, you can see the building balance there because of the increased numbers of students um, choosing into the district or increased co um, 
I should say increased yield for students at choosing into the district. Um, next um, page I want to draw your attention to is the bus revolving account. This is a page that actually um, had an error, so I'd like you to replace that page. Um, the error was that we had reduced the uh, projected balance in 630 based on um, anticipation of purchasing a bus next year, but the plan is actually not to purchase an additional bus till the following year. Um, so you'll see that in, instead of projecting a balance of $47,000, we're now projecting a balance of $97,000 based on not needing to purchase a bus. Too many get, oh. Too many? Sorry. The next tab I draw your attention to is 14. This includes information from the Department of Elementary and Sec Secondary Education and Department of Revenue. Um, the first page on this is the one that um, I think superintendents look to all the time, which is, F is the Chapter 70 summary. Um, and the most important part of this is in the second column highlighted in red, you can see the difference in Chapter 78 to the district from last year. That's $54,840. That's based on the $20 per pupil minimum aid in the governor's proposed budget. That could change, but that's where it stands right now based on the governor's budget. Um, turning ahead two pages. <coughs> You'll see a bar chart that has a couple of lines on the top. This shows Chapter 78, the foundation budget, required net school spending, and actual net school spending. The re required net school spending is the dotted black line, and the actual school spending is the blue line. And what I want to point out is that there's a positive gap between the required net school spending and the actual school spending. There are some districts that don't have that gap. I think it's really important that we cherish the gap and try to build on it because that really is the difference. You know, I've been in districts where the minimum was the maximum and that's not the case here. Um, and I think it's important that we just keep trying to move that gap as much as we can, as much as possible, as much as reasonable. Um, then the next tab is miscellaneous information. Also points out how erroneous the foundation budget is. Yes. <laughs> yes. That you have to spend 110% of net school spending and you're still, you know, scraping to yes. do what you want to do and don't have librarians and don't have, you know, and so what I draw your attention to in this is the section called choice charter information. Um, one of the, there's a chart here that shows charter out, choice out, um, and choice in. And one of the questions that this chart is posed to people who've seen it is, the FY15 and FY16 school year in the charter column. You'll see that we are showing no increase in the number of students leaving Northampton for charter schools between 2015 and 2016. And yet, we're showing an increased assessment for charter tuition of $200,000. And so, the question is, how can zero more students cost you $200,000 more? Um, so we've been spending some time <laughs> researching this question. I have to say it wasn't easy to figure out. And um, I was pointed to parts of the Department of Education website that I'd never been on. I think <laughs> probably parts of the um, website that 
Ms. Walczak has never been on. And what we finally found was um, the tuition rates that are approved for charter schools um, in the area. And there's a tremendous, this is a brand new learning for me, there's a tremendous variance year to year in what the, um, what the approved tuition is. And so from FY15 to FY16, um, here are the approved differences in terms of percentage. Four Rivers, um, tuition increased 24.4%. Um, Hilltown, up 4%. Holyoke Community down 10.5%, PVPA up 6.6%, um, Chinese Immersion up 5.5%, and Palo Freire Social Justice up 19.6%. Um, so the average of the schools, um, not that we have an equal number of students at each school, is an increase of 8.3%. Um, and this seems to vary quite a bit from year to year. Um, from 13 to 14, the average increase for those same schools was 10.1%. From 14 to 15, it was actually a decline of 3.1%. And as I said la in this last year, it was an increase of 8.3%. So there's variability <coughs> in the tuition rates um, as well. Um, annualized over the past three years, it was an average growth in tuition uh, at the um, local charter schools of 5.1%. Um, so that's and another factor to take into account. And the tuition is different, like we pay a different tuition than Hadley pays, right. than Hadfield pays. That's right. And the more we spend per pupil in the district raises the tuition. Right. S so it's like, so you, part of what you're seeing is, we, you know, we've been increasing funding to the district, including passing overrides, et cetera and that actually much of it gets transferred to the charters via tuition. Right. Mm -hmm. So continuing on, uh, the next section is called municipal expenditures including capital. Um, this shows other expenses that are not carried in the appropriated side of the budget. Um, Retirement insurances, um, the assessments um, are reported on this page. Um, so you'll see that most of the change, most of the increase in the municipal expenditures for education come from increased insurance and the increased charter school assessment that we just discussed. Um, so there are many pages in here that you can peruse at your leisure, but the next one that I think is important to spend some time on and point out is this bar graph that shows Northampton, it's in the same section, in comparison to other local area districts and per pupil expenditure. Um, it wasn't <coughs> contrived to be this way, but uh, Northampton is pretty much in the middle of the road in terms of its per pupil expenditures. This is in district expenditures only. Um, it gets different if you add in the out of district expenditures in each of the um, each of the districts, but you can see the uh, range runs from a low of $12,172 per pupil in East Hampton <coughs> to a high of 20666 in Amherst. Northampton is 13583 Statewide average is 14415 And really, you know, Amherst Pelham and Amherst are kind of outliers if you look at where they line up as compared to the rest of it. <coughs> Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Knowing after seeing um, the mayor's budget presentation and how Longmeadow pays the highest property tax rate, can you just explain why Longmeadow is there? Like, or no? I know it's not I, Northampton, but it just yeah. in terms of the per pupil spending, it's confusing to me. So I would really have to take a look at the okay. budget in order to answer that question. Um, and then I would just point out after that starts a glossary uh, which explains some of the jargon used in the budget and um, what all these DESI codes that you see populating the budget actually mean. So for anyone wanting to understand it, that may be helpful. So that's what the budget book looks like at this point in time. Are there any uh, questions or comments about the, uh, 
Mr. Baird? Yeah, sure. I've got um, some comments and I've got um, three different questions. Um, first, I just want to reiterate um, my phrase around the process. We, we, we saw that more in the presentation, but it was very collaborative the way we went about creating the budget. I appreciate that. I'm sure staff really appreciate that. Um, I also really enjoyed reading the profiles, and some things that jumped out to me were the RTI work that's happened across the elementary schools. Um, I was very interested to read about the Genius Hour over at um, Bridge Street. Mm -hmm. Um, the Lego robotics work happening at Leeds, and hopefully we'll expand over to Ryan Road. Um, and I also was excited to um, read about the expansion of the vertical math team from more of a secondary focus to a K-12 focus. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, a, a step in the right direction. Um, and I also am really excited about the STEM and robotics work for next year. Um, I think that those are all really exciting things. Um, so I didn't see you, you didn't receive any comments or questions around the athletic fees, but I know that was something we talked about last time. Um, and so for, for the, good of the good of the viewing public, the uh, fees for anybody receiving free lunch are zero. And so just want to reiterate that, um, but you didn't receive any comments or questions about that. No. So um, my, my questions are really more about the ESP and the libraries. Um, so one of the, one of the comments that was out there was the idea of what about one librarian with four ESPs? Could you talk to that a bit? Yes. Um, I did get a comment specifically about that model and I costed it out. It is, as you would imagine, more expensive than having one librarian and, or two librarians and two ESPs. And for me, I don't think it's the best value for the money because then you're paying more money and only getting one librarian. Um, so if you replace two of the ESPs, you still have the libraries open full-time, still staffed by someone full-time, and you have two librarians in the mix for the elementary schools. And do you envision, or who do you envision really delivering the instruction? Is it going to be more the librarian, the ESP, a mixture? Well, I can tell you from my observations, I've seen ESPs delivering instruction in the libraries. It happens all the time. Um, I imagine that would still happen to some extent. My hope would be, my expectation would be, that if we hire licensed library media specialists that they'll be able to deliver instruction on a different level. Um, so I would hope that those responsibilities would fall more to them and that the um, more of the aspects of maintaining the library would run to the, go to the library ESPs. Um, and then my last question is really around the, um, the charter schools and the school choice. That page really jumped out at me. Um, I did some quick calculations just looking at the last 10 years and so because I'm, I'm a math guy so um, so charter schools we've gone from again just doing a 10-year comparison 06 144 to 203 or a 41 percent increase in students going out to charter schools choosing out um, 47 students to 85 or an 80 percent increase um, and for choosing in, we went from 191 to 219, or about a 15% increase. So I guess my questions are, where do we anticipate this trend going? It obviously has a huge impact on the budget, um, and I'm wondering what efforts may be underway to determine why families are choosing out of the district. So I'll start with the last part first. Yep. There, there is a survey that's out right now to all of our Northampton residents who have choice students, or I said chartered students um, out. We're also going to be deploying that s survey shortly to parents who've choiced um, their students out. Um, so we have some preliminary data in, but um, I, I want to make sure I have a good sample size before I start trying to analyze it. Um, the choice in is interesting um, because we're, we're kind of, as you know, we're increasing the kindergarten next year, we're, we're seeing increased enrollment in the lower grades, and I think that that may have a sort of limiting effect long term on the number of kids we're able to choice in. Um, because the last thing you want to do is add positions in order to accommodate choice kids. Um, if you start getting into that, you can become upside down, where local residents are actually subsidizing kids choiced in from other <coughs> communities. Um, so I think we probably are at about the max um, of what we can do with the choice program. There's another program um, that Mr. Lombardi and I want to speak to the committee about at a later date that involves a different kind of choice. 
that I think um, could really impact the finances of this. Um, so I'll just sort of tease that one. Um, the charter out, I think, really is going to depend upon what happens with this charter cap. You know, uh, I'm not certain whether there will be more charters in the area if the cap is lifted. My sense is that um, the demand for um, additional charter schools is more in the eastern part of the state, but there, there could be more um, if the cap was lifted, um, especially if there's no cap in underperforming districts. You know, we're right next door to an underperforming district. You could have dozens of charters there, you know, conceivably. So I think that's a very, um, that's a very real threat to the district. And, you know, I certainly support any efforts at charter reform, you know, especially when you have situations where, you know, you have 0% increase from year to year and a $200,000 increase in Delta, uh -huh. you know, um, fair is fair. So, yeah, uh, so I, as I said, we may, be, we may be somewhat constrained in our ability to accept more choice students in. Um, there is this other program that I'll, we'll be coming to talk to you about in the future. Hopefully some of the information that is gleaned from the survey of charter school parents and choice parents um, may be helpful for us in thinking about how we might want to deploy um, some resources. You know, I'll just say kind of, just not to, to analyze partial data too much, but I kind of wish I'd had that data when we started this process because some of the, some of the um, preliminary information seems to be talking about more art and more music you know, and we might have made different choices in the budget, but I don't know if that'll hold up, but we'll know that next year. Um, I want to say one other thing. Oh, uh, but I do want to say this at least. Um, the, the response to the survey, I think, has already had a positive impact. You know, I've had a lot of parents say, thank you for at least asking us. You know, we've been treated kind of like we are, you know, castaways from Northampton because we decided to put our kids in a charter school so we're interested that you still care and we're, we're affirm that you still care um, I don't know if this this is probably purely <coughs> coincidental but the day after the survey was launched two kids came back from charter school so I don't know <laughs> we'll see what happens I've had another survey <laughs> <laughs> but so I guess do you see this assuming we didn't have any new charter schools coming into the area do you think that we've sort of have topped out of kids going to charter that there's not necessarily room for more kids and like we, it would be fairly stabilized i think the charter um i think the charter thing is likely to be stabilized at this point yeah. um as you can see even going through the 10-year cycle slow down it's kind of yeah um the choice out is a different matter you know because we're surrounded by communities with declining enrollment mm -hmm. they have kind of the opposite problem that I'm foreseeing for us, which is completely chock full of kids and can't take any more choice kids. They could easily, many of the communities around us, take more kids due to their falling enrollment. Yes. Um, so thank you so much um, for all of this work. I really echo what Tom was saying. There's so many wonderful things. And I, um, although sometimes I would have loved to be able to compare the exact same uh, standards from the principal's reports, I did really appreciate that their personalities did come out. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked that you gave them that creativity and leeway to know their communities a lot. Um, to, I have um, four questions. But to follow up on, Tom, on Tom's charter school question, the only change, though, is that the Chinese immersion is starting a high school program. So theoretically, that could we didn't have a high school at the Chinese immersion. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So that could, no, in well, fact, there's, there's been a high school for, um, they've had high school students for a couple of years now. They may oh, be they increasing have. enrollment. I don't know, but there has but it's been. it's building because. They, uh, I know a they, junior in high school at the Chinese immersion. So would that, has that affected it or no? I, I would say that uh, if there is an impact, it's probably minimal. When you look at the schools that our kids go to, Far and away, the largest one is Hilltown. Okay. Okay. So, um, my first question, sort of curiosities, why is it so difficult for the libraries to have um, a full-time librarian when we have 
a full-time art teacher, full-time music teacher, and a PE. There's one extra PE teacher that has to come to Jackson Street School. Why is it harder? Those are all specials that contain the same amount of time as the library. Mm -hmm. Why is it harder to fill the library time? Do you understand what I'm asking? Not quite. OK, so each school <coughs> shares music and art. Yes. Right. And each class has those once a week. Right. So in a, in a school, each class goes to library once a week. So why can't we have two librarians? I'm confused. So why wouldn't that provide sufficient yeah. coverage? Um, well, right now, the libraries are open all day long. Right. If you went to half time, or if you went to two positions, then they'd they be, be closed half the, time. OK, sorry. All right, thank you. That, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, what is the, um, or has there been thought with this whole leads taking over the preschool, was there a discussion of moving a smaller program to leads if they're the largest school and they're going to start having ELL and then put the preschool at a different school? And what was that conversation like? So we had considered moving the learning disabilities program from Bridge to Leeds. It would have been an opportune time to do it because a number of the students are currently fifth graders and so they'd be transitioning to JFK anyways. Um, the reason that that was determined not to be the, the program to move was because part of what we're trying to do is to relieve um, some of the pressure that all the programs have caused at Bridge Street in an effort to help them move up. Um, and so it's, it was a difference of moving what next year is projected to be four or five students as opposed to moving half of the preschoolers. The program at um, Ryan Road has how many? I'm, I'm not sure. I would say that it's probably less than a dozen. And did, was that a thought of moving the Ryan Road program to Leeds and putting the preschool at Leeds? Um, then you'd be moving two programs to Leeds. No, I meant switching them. So the preschool would go to Ryan Road, and the program at Leeds, which is smaller, would go to Leeds, which has a larger population. No, no? we didn't consider that. OK. Um, and then the last question was, I was just curious, um, how is it that Bridge Street School and Leeds have playground supports and not Jackson Street? And I, or maybe I misunderstood. You said that you, for the playground support that you're hiring, at this point, Leeds right. and Bridge Street School right. have them. Why doesn't Jackson Street and Ryan Road have them? I said that Bridge Street had them last year. Okay. And that Leeds has them this year. The reason that they're not in any of the other budgets is because they weren't budgeted for, they weren't requested by the principals okay. this that year. That was an individual yes. choice of how to spend. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Fallon? Um, I guess my question is more a hypothetical. I feel like some really compelling art, um, arguments were made in favor of even increasing the staffing at the libraries for one year to get this process of digitization and the collections built and how beneficial that would be. Is that on our list of priorities if the funding were to be increased? I don't know, what, what's your plan if Governor Baker finally goes, you guys are right, I should give more money to the schools. Um, well, I don't know what, <coughs> how, how do we decide what our priorities for? I saw him yesterday, he, he didn't express that. I can't believe I missed it. But I'm just saying, do we have some sort of a plan? What happens if, if money suddenly becomes available? Do we have a list, or do you just get to decide at what happens? <laughs> no, if there was more money put in the budget, or even, it could add another one, if City Council says this budget isn't enough, we need to give the schools more money, then you know the process would start over again. I would you know meet with the ALT team. I'd talk about how to spend the additional funds. I'd bring you a new budget book, and there'd be deliberation. <coughs> Um, but so it's time for like that we is have a waiting list of projects. It doesn't work that way. Right now, based on the changes that I've made in this, the top thing that would be on my waiting list is to put the ETL back in, okay. because it's not like it wasn't wanted. You know, it's just that I think the library ESPs were wanted more. Just FYI, <laughs> the council can't add money to the city budget. That's just one of the. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's a fun, it's a fun dream, but they yes. can't actually. They can cut, but they can't add. I mean, what the possibility that could happen, and this has happened the last two or three years. It happened with Governor Patrick. It happened, you know, the the um, Governor Baker 
uh, did as he did last year, did propose twenty dollar per child minimum increase in Chapter Seventy to minimum aid districts, and then the legislature, you know, increased it a whole five dollars per child, and then you know, took a victory, <laughs> took a victory yes. lap because they had right. saved us. So, um, so there's that possibility that that they may raise it. But that's. Fifty five thousand dollars. So What's that? Yeah, it's probably a, like five thousand yeah, dollars. It's, it's um, five dollars times twenty five hundred kids. So, uh, so it won't be significant. Um, so, but that, but we'll see. Uh, we're waiting for the house budget to come out in early April. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Just thought maybe since we're all here talking about it, if we had a little wish yeah. list of. I think the challenge is that the um, is that because there's basically, uh, it seems like it's been decided at least by the governor and by the house that there won't be any new revenue, um, that the only way you are gonna increase funding for chapter 70 is you're gonna have to cut elsewhere. So that's gonna be the challenge. So um, there's just no new revenue. That discussion's been taken off the table. And the Senate can't, the Senate who I think actually would support new revenue is the only body that can't propose new revenue. Any other questions about the budget? Um, I have a Mr. Question. Moore. Well, sort of a question, but I think I'm right about this. <coughs> this materials are available, are they available online? Or? They'll be available online tomorrow morning. Okay. So for, for members of the public who want to read all this stuff, please do. And we don't vote on this until the middle of April. Is that correct? So. Um, so there's some time if you had a brilliant insight to share it with, share it with uh, really the superintendent's office. <laughs> I guess I would also add that it has been online in original version already, mm -hmm. and so you you have received some comments already. There's right. been a, a few changes to it this evening that we've been uh, that's been shared to us. So. Um, Perhaps uh, if questions or concerns or comments are forthcoming, that the sooner they come in, the, the better it might be in right. planning. Because although we are voting on it in mid-April, um, that's just a, a few short weeks away. And so in fairness to the superintendent to air mm -hmm. those concerns and see if there are viable changes that can be made, um, giving him the amount of time necessary and then the committee time to hear his report on it um, would, would be helpful for us in, in voting the budget. So. Mm -hmm. I just, oh, go ahead. I just had a question on the, um, so the, I'm assuming that this net cost on charter out is from the cherry sheet balancing charter reimbursement with the outgoing yeah. charter tuition. And I'm just wondering, um, do we have a projection in knowing that this obviously is complicated by the fact that the tuitions change every year of since it's a declining schedule, how much, let's assume that every kid who's at a charter now stays in the same place, um, how much that reimbursement might drop next year? Is that in the $100,000, $200,000 range? Just make have, it's, yeah. it's 100 percent dropping to 25, 25, 25 when they pay it, but then sometimes they don't actually well, pay Well, that. that's the other factor that complicates it. It's subject to appropriations. Right. So. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to, again, thank you and congratulate you and thank, obviously, the um, business administrator, who I know also worked a lot on this. And uh, just it's a great, great budget, great presentation. And, and um, I do encourage members of the public to check it out when it's online tomorrow. So I guess I would also make another comment before we move on. And okay. uh, being a, a veteran member in previous budgets, um, not only that I oftentimes say that this one's a lot uh, more palatable because we're not talking about huge um, cuts. But if you were to just pick up one of the budget books in the recent uh, past, you'd realize that it's not nearly as comprehensive of the book that's been put together by our current superintendent and our business administrator. So I'm grateful for the transparency and the um, thoroughness in which it's put together so that we can make uh, smart choices on the vote. And if, if I could. Sure. 
there, there is an unsung hero in all of this. Um, it's important that we recognize Laura, um, who, I have to say this, um, on her own initiative, in an effort to save the district money, took on the responsibility of personally reproducing and assembling these entire books last year. We had them done um, at a print shop, and so cost savings there was over $1,000. The spirit shown by Laura was great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Um, so, uh, this was a discussion on the budget. Obviously, the um, school committee's <coughs> next meeting, which is April 14th, will be having um, a vote on it um, as required by charter. Um, the next item on the agenda is a vote to extend the NCTV lease at Northampton High School. I can turn it over to the business administrator. Yes, we touched on this briefly at the last regular school committee meeting. Um, because of the turnover in both NCTV and the school department, nobody had realized that the lease of the space at the high school was expiring about a week and a half from now. So we've already had a couple of meetings with the um, town attorney and the high school principal and central services and NCTV to talk about the direction to go. At this point, there's a number of issues going on in terms of a future long-term lease. So what we're recommending right now is that the school committee approve a short-term lease. I originally called it an extension. Um, but the a town a city attorney feels that calling it a short-term lease is more appropriate. It would actually be a separate lease rather than extension of the current, and that's for some legal reasons. So I'm asking the school committee tonight to recommend or to authorize um, a short-term lease up to 16 months. What we're, The reason for that number, <coughs> we can do a short-term lease without going out to bid up to a limit of $35,000 using the value of the space that's used right now from the assessor's office, we could go out 16 months before we hit that $35,000 threshold. If we ultimately choose to do that and we're still discussing with all the parties whether six months or 12 months or 16 is the right number, if we go out to 16 months, that would take us up to August of 2017. There's some discussion about how much space NCTV will be looking for in September of 2017. So we may go out that entire period to get us right up to the window in terms of what they're going to do. The, the next step after the short-term lease will actually be put together an RFP similar to what we did for Fiker School and go out to bid for proposals for presumably what will probably be a 10-year lease, which is what the past lease was. This process, if you vote this tonight, does also take a vote from the City Council and the Department of Ed because we're surplusing space in an active school building. So your vote would be the first of the three votes needed to proceed with a short-term lease. Make a motion to extend the uh, NCTV lease at North Ham High School. Second. Actually, you want to. Um, it's a. We want to offer a short-term lease. Correct. Is that the right? Rather than extend. Rather than the word extend. Mm -hmm. So, I make a motion to uh, offer a short. -term offer a short-term lease. Short lease to NCTV. Up to sixteen months. Up to 16 months at Northampton High School. <laughs> Great motion. All right. Did you get a second? <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Mr. Meyer seconds. Okay. Any discussion on that? Can I just ask so when you said you put it out for an RFP, because it isn't an active school, it would be very specific that that's we want an operating television like with a then? license to operate in right. Northampton. Right, so it would be really specific. Okay. Similar to how FIKER was very specific okay. to what we wanted for the early childhood program. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. No danger of like Fox News. Right. <laughs> no, I was like, I know, <laughs> okay, so there's a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next is a vote uh, to accept a gift. This is from the Florence Savings Bank Customer Choice uh, Community Grant, uh, $2,177 to Ryan Road. Yes, we're asking the school committee to approve this tonight because Ryan Road would like to purchase some Chromebooks before the next school committee meeting. This was part of the community fundraising that Florence Savings Bank does and the um, actual amount donated to Ryan Road through that process of 2177 will all go towards technology in the building. Is there a motion? 
I can try this one, unless, <laughs> Mr. Baird, would you like to no, give it a whirl? No, please. No. Okay. Um, I would like to make a motion to accept the gift Florence Savings Bank Customer Choice Community Grant for $2,177 to Ryan Road School for the purchase of Chromebooks. I'll second. Seconded by Mr. Baird. Any discussion on that? I'd like to just say, um, as a Ward 6 representative, but more importantly, <laughs> as a Ryan Road parent, I'm sure uh, Principal Madden and her staff would be very appreciative of this gift, assuming that we accept it tonight. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the gift is accepted. Uh, do not believe we have any new business this evening. Um, future business and meeting dates, I just cited the April 14th, uh, 2016, the next regular meeting of the school committee. Um, and then we do have a request for an executive session uh, in the JFK Principals Conference Room. And I would ask the Vice Chair to make that motion. Okay, I make a motion, a uh, request for an executive session in the JFK Principals Conference Room under Massachusetts General Law, Open Meeting Law for the approval of executive session minutes. January 14, 2016 and March 18, 2016 in Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining NACE, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and <coughs> details would compromise the reason for going into executive session. Okay. Um, is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay. Um, and so we will need a roll call vote, please. Can I ask a question? Sure. Are we going to adjourn from executive session? Um, that was going to be my plan, and I was going to announce that okay. after we, um, yes. Okay. Yep. Um. Present. No, yes. yes. I mean, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. why I got that award. Because <laughs> you're so funny. <laughs> yes. Hi. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <Thank you. laughs> yes. Okay, so I need to announce to the public that we are now going to move into an executive session uh, because to discuss the matters we'll be discussing in executive session, an open session uh, would be detrimental to, uh, to the matters before us. And I also need to announce that we will adjourn directly from executive session and not return to open session. Thank you.